أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على علي بن موسى الربا المرتضى الإمام التغي النغي وحجتك على من فوق الأرض ومن تحت الثرى السدير الشهيد صلاة كثيرة تامة زاكية متواصلة متواترة مترادفة كأفضل ما صليت على أحد من أوليائك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته respected brothers and sisters Alhamdulillah uh, a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who led us to uh, talk this far because it was really a blessing even for me because I could do that uh, in a different language it was very it was re- really a pleasure for me Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and I think it was an uh, opening for all of us to look at the Islamic teachings in a different way because you know that we uh, usually people usually look at the Islamic teachings and thoughts very very uh, simply without any you know they always avoid the any sophisticating issues and they just want some rudimentary information but we know that Islam is much bigger and much higher than many of us even imagine and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with this opportunity to talk about some pillars of Islamic thoughts according to greatest scholars of Islam, especially Allah Muta Wata and Shaykh Mutahari. And Alhamdulillah, now uh, I, I can say that we came too far, Alhamdulillah. You know, we started from the necessity uh, for the religion. We talked about the Tawheed, the monotheism. We talked about different worldviews. We talked about the scientific worldviews. We talked about the scientific rejections on the existence of God. We uh, brought some arguments to prove the existence of God, and we compared the, the, the worldview of atheism and monotheism. And I think we could find out that Islam is really uh, greater than many of us would even uh, imagine or think. And I think that for now we can say that if we really present Islam as it really is, many of people all over the world will be attracted to Islam and will accept the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his progeny. Okay, and then we uh, had a very important discussion on the human being in Islam. As I said, it, it could be the most important discussion. Yes, Tawheed is the pillar of everything. Everything returns to Tawheed. But everything we learn in the discussion of Tawheed uh, must have a result in the discussion of the human being in Islam. And human being in Islam is really a great... And, and very important and very needed discussion. And we talked about the human being in Islam. We talked about the two different manners of human being. We talked about the combination of al-khalq and al-amr, the material creation of the human being and immaterial creation of the human being. And then we reached the discussion of al-nubuwa, the prophethood, and then tonight, inshallah, al-imam. I, I thank you to uh, kindly tolerate me and uh, this nice and my English and everything. And Alhamdulillah, uh, I really am grateful to Allah to have friends and brothers and sisters like you. And uh, inshallah, we will continue this journey. This is just, the, uh, we, we're going to take a break for now. And inshallah, this connection will continue. Many thanks to our brother Sayyid Ahfad, who really sincerely, with his pure heart, uh, offered us many things throughout this, I think, two, three months. I don't know how long did it take, but I think it's at least uh, three months before Ramadan we started, and now this is the end of uh, the Qa'da. And we, I'm really, I, I really thank Sayyid Ahfad. He's a really a brilliant Muslim, alhamdulillah. It was a blessing for me to know him. And uh, inshallah, I ask you to, those people who now live in Ireland, to help him and inshallah to uh, regroup and, and shape that community there in your Masjid, the Mosque of Hussaini, I don't know what's there. Inshallah, be together and continue this journey. Many of you may be interested to come to Qom. Inshallah, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate this for anyone who loves to come here to study. But even if you couldn't make it and if you couldn't come here, it's not really necessary for everyone. It's not an obligation. You can be there and be with your uh, parents and family and other 
members of the community. And in, even in there, you can continue studying the Islamic fast. And I promise you, if you do that very hard, and if you try difficult, you know, if you, you know, tolerate the difficulties and study hard, you can be even greater than many people who are coming to Qom. It doesn't depend on Qom. Yes, if you come to Qom, it's, it's different. Yes, Qom is the center of the knowledge of Ala Muhammad now, but uh, in any place, in any location you live now, you can promote the word of Rasulullah and you can learn it and teach it, inshallah. Okay. Um, let's begin the tonight's session. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. One of the most important concepts in the Islamic worldview, especially Islamic worldview according to the Shia school of thought, is al-imama, the leadership. Tonight, I'm not going to talk about the differences between the Sunni school of thought and Shia school of thought. And I'm, and I'm not going to uh, prove the leadership of Amir al muminin which can be easily proved by many arguments. And many books was written on this. And you can refer to those books. And there you can find that it was very evidently very clear for the people and the followers of Rasulullah that Amir al muminin is the righteous successor of Rasulullah. And no one had this right to claim the leadership after Rasulullah except for Amir al-Mu'mineen. But tonight I'm talking about the position of al-Imam, the leadership. And I, I, I remember that in the Q&A session that we had a few weeks ago, we had a conversation of the, on the concept of al-Imam and I'm talking about that again, inshallah. Okay, the concept of al-Imam, firstly we want to say that it is a concept from Quran. We're not making this up from ourselves. It's not just some Iranian concept, as some people say, some Shiism concept. No, this is a concept according to Quran. Quran believes that the position of an imama is something different from the position of the prophethood and an nubuva. An nubuva is something, and an imama is something else. It's so important to know that because many people they easily, you know, refuse the concept of al imam and they say no it it doesn't we can we can't find this in the quran it's just a nubuva and the prophethood and after the prophet muhammad there is no divine person in this universe no one it's an entirely uh, this connection between the 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 transcendental world and this world and the dunya and it's really weird they believe that some people believe that after Rasulullah, there is no real connection between these human beings and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot recognize any connection. And now, inshallah, we say that in every age and time, from the beginning of the creation to the end of this creation, it is very necessary to have an imam on this earth. Human being, an entire creation, cannot be existed. Okay. So at first we go to Al-Qur'an to talk about this concept. In Surah Al-Ra'd, we have a verse in Surah Al-Ra'd, which says, إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُنْذِرْ وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ هَاتْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to the Prophet Muhammad and says, إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُنْذِرْ وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ هَاتْ You are only a warner. You just warn people. This is the reality and the position of the an the prophethood. But for every nation, there is a guide. Not just a, not just a person who just warns. There is a guide. Yes, inshallah, we will say that prophet had both positions. Al-Imam and an nubuvva Prophet Muhammad, could have both positions, like the Prophet Ibrahim and some Israelite prophets. Okay. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is a warner, the person who was, which is the duty of the prophets. But every nation, every nation has a guide. <clears throat> so Allah wa ta'ala uses this verse and says that this verse says that every, every time, every age needs a hadi, a guide. You cannot imagine an age in this world without a hadi, without a guide. 
then inshallah be connected to the al imam again in the very famous verse of quran that in the last session i talked about in the uh, verse 124 in the surah al baqarah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim beautiful verse wa idha btala ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimatin fa atammahun qala inni ja'iluka lin nas imam قال ومن ذريتي قال لا ينال عهد الظالم look at this verse is beautiful prophet ibrahim after his prophethood after he received the message of allah after he started be preaching the word of god and teaching people the word of god and he was really a prophet after years he was a prophet in quran we have this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa idha btala ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimat and he was a prophet in that, in that time so again allah tests ibrahim after his prophethood when his lord tested ibrahim ibrahim's faith abraham's faith by his words what was the words for now we're not going to talk about the reality of that words of the kalamat and then what what happened and he satisfied the test he could successfully fulfill the test ibrahim okay after that he said means allah said qala qala allah he said means allah said i am appointing you as the leader of the mankind look at the verse inni ja'alu kalin nasi imam i'm appointing you as the leader for the human being and prophet ibrahim was a prophet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put some tests before ibrahim and tells him if you can pass this test you're going to get a higher position so the position of the prophet who is something that ibrahim before this incident had this position the position of the prophet he was a prophet of god <laughs> and received the message of god but after that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests him again and after he passes the test what allah says He says, "Inni ja'alu kalin nasi imama ya Ibrahim, O oh Ibrahim, I'm appointing you as the leader, as the imam. So imam and the imama is a real concept. Look, brothers and sisters, it's not just a position of leading people, normal governments. No, because a prophet with that ability, a divine ability, and with that connection to the transcendental worlds, he has the qual- qualifications to lead the world." to lead the human beings so it's not a normal leadership it's not a normal leadership ibrahim must show that he had acquired higher attributes and higher virtues to get to that position the position of al imam so the position of al imam is something real in this world this is so important to say that you have a reality in this world called an nubuwwa the prophet and you have another reality in this world higher than the anubuwwa which is called what al imam the leadership and quran is talking about imam quran says prophet ibrahim was a prophet was a rasul and nabi but again allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests him and after he successfully passes the test allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says now you have you have the position of al imam i'm appointing you as the imam This is the concept of ja'al in nija'iluka I'm putting you there as the imam so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses Ibrahim alayhi salam with the with the reality of al imam with the reality of imam so in Quran we have the concept of al imam and the concept of al imam is something different from the concept of an nubuv the prophethood this is why this is what we inshallah will ask from our brothers in Islam who is imam by this definition after rasulullah because you see it's very beautiful after allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that i'm appointing you as the imam he says that ibrahim asks allah qala wa min dhurriyati ibrahim asked will this leadership also continue through my descendants what allah responds qala la yanalu ahd al-zalimin He says the Lord replied the unjust do not have the right to exercise my authority 
So this is the ahd of Allah, the authority of Allah. What is the authority of Allah? The al-imamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that al-imamah is my ahd. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in response to Ibrahim, he says that only just people, only people who had not in any time in their, in their life, only those people who hadn't committed any sin, they can become Allah. Anyone who commits anything and becomes a zalim, because the concept of zalim in Quran is a very general concept. It, it includes all the sinners. So you have to have some qualifications to be qualified to get the position of an imam. And the question is, who is imam after Rasulullah? Because even those people who, re who completely admire and adore, even those people, you believe, even you believe that they were not completely pure people. They had sins before Islam, after Islam, and in the time they were leading the Islamic nation. They had sins. They had too many mistakes. So who is the person who carries this reality of the Rasulullah? And, and what you're going to do with this concept, concept of al-imamah? Where is the concept of al-imamah in your theology, in your Islamic worldview? Okay. So Ibrahim, in addition to what he had before as the prophethood, he could gain the reality and the position of al-imamah. So what is the position of al-imamah? Allah ta'ala ta ta again in tafsir, Al-Mizan, he beautifully describes the concept of Al-Imam. For those who are interested to read more, you can refer to the uh, first volume of Tafsir Al-Mizan under this, this verse, the verse 124. If you follow the uh, words of Allah, Tawai, you reach a topic, he, he talks about the Al-Imam. It's a very complete topic. He talks about all the aspects of the reality of Al-Imam. Okay. But what's the role, the, the role of the Imam. Who is Imam? What's the difference between Imam and Nabi? If you remember, uh, when we were in our early sessions, I have talked about, uh, yes, I had a map here, yes, and said that the uh, center of everything in Islamic worldview is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is Tawheed. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I said that we have two discussions here. First is about the Allah's attributes, like justice. And second is the discussion concerning the man. And discussion concerning the man, we had a general discussion. We called that the human being in Islam, and we talked about that. And then I said we have a legal guidance for this man and an existential guidance for this man. The legal guidance is called prophethood. The existential guidance, I gave this concept, this name, the existential guidance, and I'm gonna explain that, is the leadership and al-imam. Okay, listen carefully, please. Rasulullah, Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and other prophets, from the prophethood aspect of their reality. What is their duty? They instruct people and they tell people to do's and not to do's. They give instructions, laws, regulations to people. They receive and deliver the message of God, the Torah, the Gospel, Injil, the Quran, the Zabur of Dawood. So they are instructions, they are books, to do's and not to do's. Go to Hajj. Pray, do not commit adultery, do not lie, don't gossip, don't backbite, okay? So, me as a Muslim, as a Jew, as a Christian, as a follower of Ibrahim, I'm the listener of these instructions. I'm the audience of this book. So, they tell me, do that, okay? I'm free to do or not to do. This is just legal. It's a law. It doesn't interfere in my heart. No, it's a law. He preaches and promotes the laws and regulations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the legal guidance. 
It's exactly what you do with your students when you're a teacher, with your children when you are a father or mother. You tell your children, do that, do not do that, okay? This is the legal guidance. But we have another kind of guidance. And that is, I call that existential guidance. What does that mean? Look, sometimes, sometimes, you see that your child is going to touch a knife, a very sharp knife, and you yell at him or her, don't touch that knife. Don't touch the knife. You instruct him, okay? But sometimes you don't instruct him. You go and take his hand and put it off the knife. And, and you put the knife aside. So you intervene in this incident. You don't just say, don't do that. No, no. You go into the incident. And you intervene into that. This kind of guidance, and it's just a uh, metaphor for that. This kind of guidance is called existential guidance. In existential guidance, the guide, the imam, the leader, the person who is guiding you, he doesn't say do or not. No. He comes and inter intervenes in your heart and uh, elevates your heart and distract your attention from something and make you concentrate, concentrate on something else internally. He doesn't talk to you. He acts in you. This is the existential guidance. And this is related to the Amr of Allah. Do you remember the Amr al-Khalq? Who remembers? Do you remember that? We said that a human being in his creation is not just a material creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, created human being from clay, yes. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? We gave him another creation. And that was Amr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? We have created Adam from clay. But it's not the end of the story. And then we told Adam, Kun fayakun, be. Kun fayakun. And he, and he became the reality of human being, the reality of Adam. So Adam has a clay aspect of creation. The clear related aspect of the creation, which is a material aspect of the creation. And also an immaterial aspect of the creation. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِمْ in ruhi. This is the spirit of God which was connected and became related and connected to the human being. Okay, so the imam's guidance is related to the amr of Allah. And if you remember, what was Amr? The Amr was the immediate, immaterial aspect of the creation. We said that, imagine when an apple is going to become a ripe apple, it's just before a seed, and then a tree, and tree grows and grows, and then apple, just very green apple, and it takes a long time for that apple to become a fresh apple and, and ready to eat. So it's a process for the creation of what? Of apple. This is called al-khalq. But we have another part of the creation in transcendental vaults. And that is related to the soul and to the spirit of the human being and the vault. There, there is no process. There is no time. There is no space. It's just the reality of the immaterial vault. Imam, Imam, what does he do? Imam comes and takes our immaterial aspect of the creation and elevates this aspect, raises this aspect. So we just need to be prepared for that. And this is the philosophy of Ziyarah. This is the philosophy of Ziyarat Aminullah. This is the philo philosophy of the Arba'een. To make yourself ready, to prepare yourself for Imam, to intervene in, in your reality. Look at the verse of Quran. It's, it's not just something that was made up by Shia people. No. Let's go to Quran. In the... Uh, yes. In the chapter... Yes. In chapter 21, verse 
73, we have this beautiful verse. أَوْضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةَ يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَ وَأَوْقَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about some prophets of the Bani Israel. What he says? He says that وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةَ يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَ we appointed them as leaders again. Do you remember what Allah said to Ibrahim? This is Imam. is plural of Imam. And we appointed them as leaders to guide the people. Yahduna to guide. Yahduna means to guide the people. Through our command, command. Do you remember the Amr? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we appointed this people to guide other people, not by saying do and not to do. No. Bi amrina. What is the amr of Allah? Do you remember what was the amr of Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly, very uh, precisely and specifically described the reality of Amr in Quran. We have in this surah, surah to Yasin. Yes, uh, let me find the verse here. Yes, in surah to Yasin, okay. Yes, in Surah to Yasin, verse 82, here. I'm sharing. Okay. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ What is the Amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the reality of Amr? إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ Whenever he decides to create something, he has only to say exist, and it comes into existence, and it's not a very good translation for that. Yes, it's not good either. Okay. I'm asking you to write some good translation for Quran. Yes, it's better. And his command, this is the Amr of Allah, is what? When he desires a thing, is to say to it, to that thing. Be, kun. Kun means be. And it is, فيكون. it comes to the existence. So this is the Amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the Amr of Allah? The Amr of Allah is that kind of creation that has no process. It takes no time. So it must not be in this material world. It must not be of this material things. Because all the material things in the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created takes time to come to existence. Everything in this material world. Look, my hand, when it wants to take, when it wants to reach here, it takes time. Yes, sometimes it moves very slowly, sometimes fast. But anyways, it takes time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have another kind of creation that doesn't take any time. And that is the reality of Al-Amr. And there in Quran, we recite that and we read that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have appointed them, this people, to guide people through my amr. And it's very hard to translate amr to command of Allah. Yes, it's, you know, it's of those words that really hard to translate to any language, even in Farsi or do English. Anyways, you just need to describe it. Like al-fitra. Yes, al-fitra has no equivalent, but yes, amr has some equivalents like command. But you need to focus on the real meaning. Okay. So, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ عِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا These people who are called Al-Imam, these are Imam people, these are who uh, guide people, but their guidance is not to s tell people do or not to do. Look at the Prophets. When Allah talks, subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to talk about the Prophets, He says that they are mubashirina wa mundhirin. They give glad tidings. They said this is a paradise. If you perform good deeds, you will be placed in beautiful palaces in this in the paradise, and if you commit the acts of transgression, okay, you will be burned in the damnation. This is the Mundirin, warns you and gives you glad tidings. Yes, this is a prophet. But Imam, Yahduna bi Amrina, you don't have Yahduna bi Amrina about prophets in any verse of Quran. You can't find that. Anywhere, 
amr of Allah is connected to the Prophet. No, you can't find that. So an imam guides people through the amr of Allah. What does that mean? It means that imam has an existential guidance. So imam comes and intervenes in the soul and the reality and the entity of people. He doesn't just instruct them. Yes, he has instructions because he is the continuation of the prophets. But imam, what is imam? Imam has both realities. Question. What about Prophet Muhammad? Prophet Muhammad has both attributes, both positions. Prophet Ibrahim, as we read now, recently from the Surah Al-Baqarah, he has both positions. Even Prophet Moses, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So, so, if a prophet has the position and authority of an imam, yes, he has this ability to guide people through the reality of them, through the amr of Allah. But yes, some prophets has this position, of, but, but some other prophets, they don't have this position. But the thing is, in every age, in every time, this universe, this creation has to have an imam. Why? Because to be able to take the path of Allah and reach the higher levels of spirituality, which is the purpose of the creation, every time, always, this is the purpose of creation, there must be a person who can intercede between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and transcendental vault and this material vault. So in any time, when a human being, a person wants to reach higher levels, he needs to have imam. And he doesn't need to personally know imam, no. He may, he may not know imam in person, but he needs, he needs to concentrate and to ask the reality of that imam to help him go higher and higher. And this is the reality of the ziyara al jamaat al kabira a very beautiful, meaningful, full. This is the ocean of meaning. That's the art. And it's all talking about this reality. This is why after the martyrdom of all 11 Imams of Ahlul Bayt, we believe that even a blink of eye, even for that very, very short time, this world cannot be empty of the representative of Allah and of a real imam. This is why we believe that in all times we need imam. They ask us, where is your imam? He is living in a cave or in some islands. We can't see him, you can see him. And you are crying for him every Friday, okay. What's the benefit of that imam for you? The answer is his benefit is not just for me. His benefit is for the entire creation because without him, there will be no creation. Without him, there will be no path of Allah. The path of Allah will be blocked without him. And we know that that path cannot be blocked. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have created you to just worship me, to level, to reach the level of tawheed, the reality of tawheed. And you can't reach that level unless you are with Imam. And we know that because Imam, please, please, listen carefully here, please, please. Because Imam, because Imam, because Imam guides people through the Amr of Allah. Please, be with me. Because he guides people through the Amr and command of Allah, so he doesn't need to have any physical interaction with us. <laughs> it, it's not necessary. For, yes, for other duties of Imam, like the political leadership, like interpreting Quran, explaining Islam for us, yes, we need to have Imam physically. But for the real and most important purpose of Imam, which is the existential guidance, we do not have to have any physical interaction with Imam. We don't have that. We don't need to have that. We can not be able for the entire life of us to visit Imam personally, and in the same time be benefited from the reality of Imam. Because Imam is not just 
the person who's going to tell us do and not to do. No, his reality in this world is guiding my reality. And these realities, which is the nafakhtu fihim in ruhi, which is the immaterial aspect of other creation, is not confined in space and time. So even Imam is in Mecca or in Medina or Karbala. In other countries, we don't know. And even I live in Africa or Australia or be it in Mexico. Mexico or in Brazil, United States of America, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Everywhere you live, you can be benefited from the light of Imam. And that is very important for you, yes? Because you live there, you sometimes you may think that I'm very disconnected and far from Mashad and Kabbalah and Qom. How can I be guided when I'm so far? No. Imam is the closest person to the closest person to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go and read the story of the Uvais al-Qarani, the person who never get to visit Rasulullah, and he was leaving the time of Rasulullah, but he could get the levels of spirituality that many, many companions of Rasulullah never could imagine that level, the level of Uvais al-Qarani. Because he was connected to the soul of Rasulullah. He was connected to the reality of Rasulullah. Yes, physical meeting is important. Yes, no, no doubt. But the most more important thing is to be connected to the reality of an imam. And this is why it is recommended for us to recite ziyarah to Ashura. This is the reality. Because, you know, many of people, and it's good, it's not bad. Many of people, they go to Karbala. They go to Bain al they go to Mashhad, they go to, um, you say the name, they go to Mashhad and they go, they go to Qom. Yes, when they reach the uh, holy shrine of Lady Fatima al Masur, Imam Raza, Imam Hussein, Salam al they ask for the, a good wife, a good husband, or to be successful in the university, or to get more money. Okay. Some other people, they go there and they ask for the forgiveness for the saints. That's very good. But some other people, this is the reality of, of Ziyar, they go there and they say that I know that I cannot reach the level of Tawheed unless you help me. So I'm ready. I'm ready for you. Just intervene in my sinful soul so I can be benefited from your existential guidance. This is the reality of al -Iman. This is the reality of a ziyara. This is the reality of, look, please go and, 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 and recite the Aziyaratul Mutlaqa for the Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. You can find it in the beginning of the ziyarat of Imam Hussein in the, in the uh, Mafatih al Janan. That's very beautiful, very beautiful, mind blowing ziyara. Bekum yuslaku ila ridwan. We recite in the Ziyarat al-Jama'at al-Kabira. Anyone who seeks the razvan, the nearness to Allah, no one can reach that level unless holds on on the rope of Ahlul Bayt. Because of you and by you I can reach the level of Radwan. Every door can be opened by you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors by you. And that, is a, that, is, that has a very great meaning, opening the door. That is the door of spirituality. Anyone who really worships the one God, believes in monotheism, he accepted this teaching from you. If he's really a monotheist, he accepted it from you. Yes, even if he's not aware of that. Okay, much to say here. And the greatest creation, the greatest, greatest things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in this universe are the light of Rasulullah and his progeny. Everything, everything is dependent on them. All the angels, the arsh of Allah, the kursi of Allah, the loh and qalam and kitab, everything, everything is dependent on the light of Rasulullah and his progeny. And we have many reasons and arguments for that. It's not just a claim. 
Okay, they ask the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Salamullahi Alayhim Ajma'in, to really look at us, look upon us, because we are senior people and we have disobeyed Allah over and over again. Every time we started to repent to Allah, have a repentance on the Sundays of the Zirad, we again we started to sin and sin and sin. And we trusted Shaitan more than Allah. We trusted Shaitan more than Allah. And in the same time, we claim that we are the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do you want to know who's the real follower? This is the last night of our discussions, and it's very good to talk about some companions of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. There is a companion of Sayyid al Shuhada. He is called Sa'id ibn Abdullah al Hanafi. He was a very sincere follower of Amir al Mu'mineen. A great person. Just hear his, he, listen to his story, inshallah. This, I ask him because he's a very great personality to help us, inshallah, and to look at this session. And by that, may Allah have a look upon us, inshallah. Okay. He was a companion of Imam Hussein after the death of Muawiyah. May Allah curse him and put him in the damnation. After the death of Muawiyah, when the people of Kufa wanted to send letters to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They had consultations and they get together and they said that they need to send some letters to the son of Amir al-Mu'minin, son of Rasulullah. They wrote letters, it is estimated more than 12,000 letters. This is the people of Kufa. And they sent these letters to Imam Hussein through this man, Sayyid ibn Abdullah al-Hanafi. And he traveled from Kufa to Medina. And he went to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And the estimated uh, distance between the Medina and Kufa, it's, it's, it's about 1,500 kilometers. Okay? And then, when Imam Hussein saw the letters, he uh, sent Muslim ibn Aqid alongside this person, Sayyid ibn Abdullah al Hanafi, again to Kufa. So he traveled again back to Kufa, another 1,500 kilometers. To, to de deliver the message of Imam Hussein. There, when Muslims settled in the Kufa and talked to the different people and people who invited Imam Hussein to Kufa, he saw that the situation is very good and Imam Hussein can come here. And he wrote a letter for Imam Hussein and gave this letter to who? To this person, Sayyid ibn Abdullah al-Hanafi. And he again traveled from Kufa this time to Mecca. Imam Hussein was in Mecca in that time. Again, almost five, 1,500 kilometers. And after that, he uh, stayed with Imam Hussein and traveled with Imam Hussein from Mecca to Ver, to Karbala. 6,000 kilometers for the message of Imam Hussein. And he was not a very young man. In that time, he couldn't take the uh, main roads. He needed to take the mountains and deserts because in the main roads, the soldiers of Yazid and Ibn Ziyad, they were waiting for him. Okay. On the day of Ashura, this is the companion. This is the person who really believes in the Imam of Ahlul Bayt. On the day of Ashura, he was the person who, stand, who stands uh, before Sayyid al Shahada and between Imam Hussein and the army of Ibn Ziyad and Umar ibn Sa'd. So no arrow and no stone would hit Imam al Hussein. Alayhi salam. He was like a shield there, standing there. For all the time that Imam Hussein was praying, this is so beautiful, brothers and sisters, so heart-wrenching, mind-blowing. And we can test ourselves to just imagine ourselves instead of him. Can we really be him? It is narrated in the Maqatil that from the beginning of Salat to the end of Salat, the soldiers of Umar ibn Sal, they started to target Imam Hussein and fire arrows, hundreds of arrows against Imam Hussein. They wanted to kill Imam Hussein during the time of Salat. But this person alongside others, he was standing before Imam Hussein and he was defending Imam Hussein. Look at the maqtal. Tawran bi wajhihi wa tawran bi sadrihi wa tawran bi janbayhi. He was defending Imam Hussein with what? Sometimes with his chest, sometimes with his body. Sometimes with his face. 
Do you really believe that? Can you believe that? He was putting his face between the arrows and the holy body of Imam Hussein. And it is said in the Maqtal. It is said in Maqtal. لم يكد يصل إلى الحسين عليه السلام شيء من ذلك. No arrow in that time could hit the body of Imam Hussein. He was completely healthy. But after he finished his salat, it is said, it said in Maqtal that وسقط الحنفي على الأرض. Sayyid ibn Abdullah fell down on the ground and then Sayyid al-Shuhada came to him. This is the reward time. Sayyid al-Shuhada came to him and he was breathing the last breaths. And he couldn't, you know, his body was covered with blood. His face was covered with blood. It is said that Imam Hussein cleaned the dust and blood from his face. And he could look at the very radiant and shining face of Imam Hussein. And you know what he said? This is the Shia. He asked Sayyid al-Shuhada, Aba faytu ya Rasulullah, ya ibn Rasulullah. Was I a loyal person? Could I pledge my allegiance? Ya Hussein. Could I preserve my loyalty to you? And he was covered in blood. He didn't say it was so hard. He didn't say it was a long journey. He didn't say it was so hard for me. It's painful. No, no, no. He asked Sayyid al-Shuhada, am I a good follower for you? And Sayyid al-Shuhada says, Eve Allah. Yes, by Allah, yes. And you will enter the paradise before me. Like here, you were, you were before me in the paradise. We both enter the heaven with this situation. This is the reality of the companionship. These people could realize the reality of Sayyid al-Shuhada and the reality of Imam and leaders of Ahlul Bayt. And we ask Allah to give us this tawfiq to be like this person, like this great individuals. Okay, at the last night of our discussions, uh, we say Islam to the great reality and personality of the entire history, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And I ask all of you to repeat after me this beautiful ziyarah of Sayyid al-Shuhada. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwaakh al-lati hallat bifinaik. عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته Very good respected brothers and sisters Thank you all for listening to me uh, and I'm really embarrassed to waste so much time of you but inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks upon us for this all sessions because this this wasn't this wasn't my words it was the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his progeny and greatest scholars of Islam and I tried to uh, give you some words that they had and uh, to just transmit some information from this side to the other and inshallah I ask you to continue reading and studying Islamic thoughts and focus on this and I believe, I really believe that you are really great, brilliant people there. You can do great jobs. Don't downplay yourself. Don't underestimate yourself. You're great and you can do great jobs because you're followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen. That's enough. That's enough for us. Just imagine that you are the lover and follower of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Lady Fatima al-Zahra, sallallahu alayha. And please forgive me for everything throughout this, I think, 20 sessions and this three month month. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, completely at your service. You can ask me any question if I can answer. And I'm just uh, posting my number here. You can access to my account on WhatsApp by this number, okay? And if there is any question, I'm at your service. Any last questions? There was a question here. Where does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that you are only a warner? Then he also says you are a giver of glad tongue. Yes, but the mundhir, because he was talking to the mushrikeen, in that you know situation, the mundhir could be the better title for Rasulullah because he was warned them from the uh, fire of the hell. Thus Prophet Isa has imama. Yes, it is called said that he, he has the reality of an imama. Yes, yes. 
Okay, any other? Thank you all. Thank you all for your works. Stay good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jazakumullah, inshallah. Thank you all. What should be our duties during the occultation of the 12th Imam? When we read narrations, we see that we are to observe taqiyya and not take part in any political activities. No, there is no uh, narration. I mean, the narration, when we talk about the narrations, we have many narrations. We have thousands of narrations. We have a narration that a, a person from Qum, he will rise up and he will start a revolution and everyone must join him. And that is the prerequisite of the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi. So our duty is to take the path of Rasulullah and his progeny and be completely prepared and, and distinguish the oppressor from the oppressed person. Distinguish false ulama and false scholars from the real scholars. Distinguish those people who stand by oppressed people of this world and those people who just love the oppressors of this world, even if they are wearing this turban that I'm wearing. And it's not so hard now. I know, I know that there are too many misinformations, but it's not so hard. It's, for me, it's solved now. If you ask me, it's the last session. I never talked like that. Okay? But for me, it is simple now because I know my Imam, Imam al Mahdi, and I know I need to follow his real. Uh, successor in our daily life which is for me Imam al-Khamenei and I know he's standing with the oppressed people and he's against the oppressors and all the tyrannies of this world all the satans of this world all the tyrants of this world, villains of this world are against him, that's enough for me this is what Amir al-Mu'mineen was this is what Fatima al-Zahra was this is, what Imam, this is what Imam Hassan was this is what Imam al-Hussein was and I know that and I can feel that with my all senses that's enough for me. And I'm, I'm not saying that we, do, we, we should not follow any other scholar. No, all, all these scholars of Ahlul Bayt, many of them, not all, all of them, are respected. They provide, they're providing knowledge to us. But, you know, in the battlefield, some person is the commander. He's bearing, he's bearing the flag. He's getting the arrows. His body is full of blood. Find the person whose body is full of blood, of villains, enemies, and adversaries of Islam. Look, who's the most, you know, look at the enemies of Islam. Look how much they show their animosity. And who's the person who's receiving the most animosity of those people? I think that would be so easy to understand. Okay, inshallah, uh, Allah protects you, everyone. Protects your body and your soul and your thoughts. And uh, inshallah, Rahman, someday... I know tonight, this, sorry, this year because of this virus, you couldn't come to Iran and visit the shrine of Lady Fatimah Ma'asuma and, and, and Imam Abu Rida alayhi salam. Inshallah, I really uh, want to see you in person, inshallah, here in Iran, inshallah, after the, this virus is defeated, inshallah, very soon, inshallah, you can come here and uh, visit Lady Fatimah Lady. And inshallah, I can visit you too, and we can have this discussion here in person. Okay, thank you all, and thank you, brother Sayyid Ahfad, for inviting me to the sessions and to preparing everything. Inshallah, Allah gives you the, uh, the highest rewards possible, inshallah. And thanks to our brother and wise scholar, Sayyid Haider Hassanin, who first talked about you, who talked about the Friday Night Circle and Sayyid Ahfad. And he really invited me to this session, inshallah. And I, I can say thank you to him in person because he's in Qom now. Okay, inshallah. Yes, sometimes I could uh, have this tawfiq to visit the, I don't know, there is no shrine there, but there are good people there, inshallah, in, one, in, in a time. This is what I, I'm thinking about because we need to uh, increase the borders of our promotion of Islam. Inshallah, you are good people for that there. Okay, wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته رحم الله من يقرأ الفاتحة مع الصلوات